let's dive in. So why, why protect trees during development? What's the point? Why, why does it matter? Does that interact? So it's proactive, right? Uh, what else? What else do we have? Okay, that's another good reason, right? You can't you can't eat that candy gold if you're you're losing trees. Yeah. Uh, uh, cheaper to preserve than replant. It's cheaper to preserve than every plant. That may not necessarily be true in all cases, but uh, but it could be true. Expensive to remove trees when there's a house under it. That's true. Yeah, absolutely. It's more expensive to remove it when there's some values at risk, so I say. Yeah, when you compromise the The general public likes to see trees. They like to see them kept and preserved as much as possible. And construction upsets people a lot of times when things change. So, as much as you can preserve of things, makes it so there's one that folks do, do uh, bring up, but I'll bring it up right now, and that's ecosystem services. And so ecosystem services is a relatively new term that we're using to describe the benefits that trees provide to people in the okay, So whether it's stormwater retention, or uh, buffering of winds, or energy conservation, or uh, uh, cooling and shading, or wildlife habitat, there's, and, or they just be intrinsic values of, of trees being, you know, I have a, this photo from the, from the Japanese garden up here, like, there are cultural reasons that we're interested in trees as well as the environmental reasons, right? But I would say that the cultural value is still an ecosystem service, right? So, uh, and, and really, uh, with those of you who are familiar with Kathy Wolf, she's a researcher at the University of Washington, uh, doing a lot of work on the public health benefits of trees. So the, that research is overwhelming. Um, the website that she has is called Green Cities Good Help. If you're interested in that topic, you should definitely go to that website. It's, it's a great resource of, of um, kind of curated, it's a curated online bibliography of the research on the public health benefits of trees. So really, like a healthy population of people is also an ecosystem service that trees provide. And that's why we're protecting trees during construction or you know, during, or just generally speaking, as trees provide this tremendous value to our communities, and, uh, and protecting them is, is essentially the, the cost that it takes to protect them is an investment in the preservation of not just the tree, but the services that it provides. And so I want to take a minute to talk about mature trees. Um, because as we know, trees grow a lot slower than our urban lives tend to. Uh, so it might take, like these, these uh, London plane trees are from Walla Walla, these, these trees are over 120 years old. Um, uh, this is uh, from Officers Row down in, um, down in Vancouver at the fort, I'm the point of the name of the fort, um, but historic landscape, right? Um, and these are, these are Norway maples in downtown Olympia, um, which I don't really care about Norway maples, but it was a nice photo. Um, but it, it takes these trees, at least 60 to 80 years to be fully matured, to put on this canopy, right? And it, a tree needs to be at least 20 years old before the cost of our investment in getting it planted and purchasing it and getting it planted and watering it and taking care of it, like once the tree is 20 years old, that's when the equation, the, the, the economics start to tip and the tree is providing more than we've given them, right, in terms of return on investment. So we want the trees to be at least 20 years old um, but, but the goal in an urban landscape is to get them to live as long as possible, to get them to grow as large as possible. Um, like every time I see a, a small tree planted in a big open field, I just, like, makes me nuts because, like, that's an opportunity. If we're going to plant a tree, let's plant one that's going to provide the large canopy, provide the large benefits because increasingly in cities, we are running out of places to put the large trees, right? So, like, um, for those of you that have been following uh, <coughs> development uh, discussions in Seattle where you have single family properties that are now have been rezoned <coughs> to uh, neighborhoods that are encouraged to densify. You, know, you take out the single family homes, you know, maybe where three or four homes may have occupied an 
area, and now it's a large condo building without room to put a large tree when there may have been several large trees on those lots prior to because it was a backyard or a front yard or what have you. Um, so we're running out of places to put these large trees. And, uh, and so the larger trees provide greater benefits. Right? The larger the tree, the more benefits it provides. Right? But essentially, like canopy coverage in, in many ways is a barometer for, for the success of our cities. Many of the things that we want in our cities can be directly correlated, and this is backed up with research, to canopy coverage, right? If we have more canopy coverage, like there's an inverse relationship between canopy coverage and impervious cover. If you have impervious cover, you can't plant a tree. I mean, we plant trees and sidewalks all the time, don't get me wrong, but, um, but, but where you have a tree, you have roots that are spreading out. So that's not compatible with impervious surface, right? So if we have more tree canopy, we have less impervious cover. If we have more impervious cover, we have less tree canopy. Like that relationship is seen over and over again in cities of all sizes across the globe. So, um, so typically, <clears throat> these trees occur on private land because really only 15 to 20 percent of the urban forest is, is, in, is in the public domain. The rest of the urban forest is in the private side. And so it's during construction, it's during development, when these houses are being redeveloped or they're being torn down and rebuilt uh, or they're being built anew, uh, just on, say, some forested property, that's the opportunity that we have to try to keep trees in the landscape, right? And because while it might take 60 or 80 years for a tree to get to maturity, any of these trees can be removed by a competent tree crew in an afternoon or a day, right? Even still, a lot less than 60 or 80 years, right? So it's very, very easy to lose canopy cover. And that's something that I stress when I talk to communities about setting their canopy goal. It's like if you are not aggressively trying to protect the trees you have and aggressively trying to plant new ones, you will not meet your canopy goal. You will not. You have to do both of those things to get there. I mean, you might meet your canopy goal 20 or 30 or 40 or 50 years after you expect it to, right? But <clears throat> until you make that commitment and put it in your policies and codes, you're not gonna get there, right? And so cities without any kind of tree protection uh, ordinances out there are just losing tree canopy year after year after year. It's just a slow burn of in decline in the tree canopy. And that, that can be measured with canopy analyses. And I know many of these cities here, Kirkland and Sammamish, um, in fact, Sammamish just got done with a great tree canopy analysis. And that, that report actually is wonderful. Um, so it was actually a, it was a report done by the Data Resource Group. Um, or are they called, sorry, Todd, are they called Data Resource Group anymore? Or are they called something else? Data Resource Group. Data Resource Group. Okay. <laughs> I was thinking of something else, but I'm glad I got it mostly right. <laughs> um, but yeah, it was a really great report. And what uh, one of the innovative things that they did is they, when going out to the community in Sammamish, they solicited uh, comments from the public about like what the urban forest means to them. And they also had a photo contest. And so their tree canopy report, <clears throat> in addition to being like very succinct and digestible, is has a litany of user submitted photos and quotes about the urban forest from, from some Amish residents. I thought that was a really nice touch. Um, so, so it's not just about the mature trees on private property, um, but it's also about our native forests as well, right? Because this is both within and outside of the city limits, right? Because within the city limits, we have these natural areas uh, on the west side here that's mostly uh, ravines and steep slopes or wetland areas that are uh, that are generally considered not developable uh, but those those natural areas are doing all the heavy lifting for our ecosystem services in our cities right so yes street trees provide benefits yes trees and yards provide benefits but the trees in the natural areas as a functional native system are doing far more in, in the way of ecosystem services so the challenge to those systems is that as we densify and develop, as we remove the tree cover from the residential areas or from the streets or from any other area that's not the natural area, right, that natural area faces an increasing burden uh, to provide the services that it provides and remain healthy, which is a challenge in and of itself, but it becomes an increasing challenge as now it's taking on more stormwater, more heat, more pollution, more users, right? There's more people, they're, they're, people are gonna use that space. 
Um, so there's a, there's a risk to those natural areas inside city limits. And that's, that's aside from climate change, right? Climate change is its own terrible problem <laughs> that we're trying to deal with. Um, but when it comes to densification and development, putting additional pressure on that system and additional stress and making it more susceptible to those ambient conditions that are already pretty adverse. Um, uh, so then, but it's also outside city limits. So we have Growth Management Act in Washington that basically says densify within city limits so that we don't sprawl out into the wildlands, but it's not, the Growth Management Act is, it's not no growth, it's managed growth. So we are still sprawling out into the wildlands, we're just doing it in a sort of slower or theoretically more controlled way. Um, but, um, I mean, I, I have a lot of opinions about GMA, and we won't go into all of them here today, but it, it, is, it does mean that we have this risk of losing tree canopy in the areas that are not currently in the So it's about individual trees, but it's also about systems. Um, this will look familiar to Phil, I think. I think it's the Sinatra Plateau. So just a good example uh, of what that looks like. So um, I think that most of us in this room, like a, a large piece of equipment like this, it's, it is designed to just destroy whatever it touches, right? It's designed to just overpower anything that it comes into contact with, right? That's its, that's its purpose uh, for, for existence, right? So I think that we understand that a, a tree or a living thing of any kind is sensitive to a machine that's designed to just overpower whatever it comes in contact with. Um, so there's this physical relationship between the two when it comes down to construction that we want to be conscious of so we can keep that equipment at, at, at a safe distance from the trees. But there's another something in this picture that is maybe less obvious but is the most important and that is the soil that's on the teeth of these diggers. Because effective tree protection is truly protection of soil. So let's talk about soil structure for just a moment. So um, this over here is just a, a mock-up of the soil horizons. And so the soil horizons are just, you know, they, they differ from place to place. Uh, and especially in urban areas, the soil horizons could be all mixed up because of those diggers that have come in and, and turned it all up. But in an undisturbed setting, um, as a result of just gravity and time and pressure um, pushing on those soils, they create these, these stratus uh, layers. And so the, the, the base layer is as what we call the seed horizon. It's mostly what we call parent material, which is essentially just that there's a lot of rocks in there. Um, and a lot of the like when we talk about mineral soil, um, those minerals that are found in soil are just eroded rock, right? <clears throat> so that's where it comes from. And so the lower horizons have more weight pushing on them from the horizons that are above them, and then the things that are located on top of that soil, whether it's plants or structures or houses or streets or whatever. So these lower, lower layers tend to be pretty heavily compacted, um, although they do still drain, but albeit slowly. Um, then we have the B horizon, which is, it's less compacted, uh, and it has more nutrition in it because um, the nutrition is coming from the soil surface and it's filtering down. So you see there's some roots drawn in here, you know, down to about 30 inches, and that's because the soil can support root growth. Um, now in a sandier soil, you might get roots that go down deeper than that, um, we'll talk about that in a minute, but generally speaking, this is a, a good guideline. So the A horizon, this is what we all call topsoil, right? Now, if you live in Walla Walla, which I brought up before, you know, down here to 45 inches is all topsoil. Um, they just have incredible soil, and that's where the delicious onions come from. But um, in massive trees, as I showed you before. Um, but um, so topsoil is great. Lots of air space, lots of oxygen. Um, so relationship between air and compaction, right? So if the soil is more compacted, that's like this over here. If it's compacted, there's less void spaces between the soil particles. That means there's less air in the soil. And less air in the soil means that the, the soil can't support life as much, right? 
So it's not just tree roots that rely on, on having air in the soil, but it's also all the fungi and bacteria and other microorganisms. They need oxygen. Like all living things need oxygen to survive. In a compacted soil where there's less oxygen, that, that soil is going to be less capable of supporting any kind of vegetation on top, right? So our urban, urban landscape is generally in this category. Even the places like parks and backyards, where we kind of regard them as being you know, more natural and more native, they're still heavily compacted compared to a, a sort of undisturbed native soil that would look more like this. Um, so then, um, so airspace also means water holding capacity, right? Because when it rains, those void spaces fill up with water. This, this diagram is a little bit of a misnomer, right? Because the water, it does adhere to the soil particles, but um, probably only when the soil is drying out is there only water stuck to the soil particles itself in like gaps between the water. Like the water would be filling all of these void spaces. Um, <clears throat> so that's obviously the trees need water too, right? So if there's more pore space, then there's more oxygen and there's more water holding capacity in that soil. In that system. Um, so that's what makes topsoil so great. Um, and the O horizon is the O is for organic. A, B, and C are just descriptors, but O stands for organic. And that's where all your you know, needles, leaves, coarse woody debris, fine woody debris, uh, all the, that's where nature's recycling system takes place, right? That's the recycling factories happening at the forest floor. That's where, you know, um, you know earthworms and beetles and and bacteria and fungi are all basically composting uh, nature's disregarded plant parts. Uh, <clears throat> and then turning those into nutrition that, that then the roots take up and provide enough nutrition for the plants to function. So the further you get in the soil profile, the less oxygen you have, the less water holding capacity you have, and the less nutrition you have. So really, all the good stuff is here is in, is in the top 10 inches of the soil down to about 30 inches. Um, so that's what we're dealing with. So really, if we're not protecting the soil, then we're not going to be able to protect the organisms that that soil supports. Um, and in fact, there's one, one anecdote from when I was a city arborist. There was, uh, it, was a, it was a new lot that had been a field I think, and, and, a, and a house was going in. So there's really no trees on the lot. Um, but I still, as they submitted their, like their first draft of their tree protection plan was, was, was basically nothing. It was just a, a copy, essentially, of their housing blueprint. And I was like, no, 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 no. We're going we're gonna to protect something here, right? So we, we cordoned off a, a, a chunk of the backyard where they didn't need to be working and kept the equipment out of that area because that, that landscape is going to be better able to support whatever trees we planted back compared to the area that's been impacted by the, by the equipment and the machines. So, um, so if um, if you many of you may have seen this diagram before, this is kind of an idealized tree root system. You'll notice that it extends beyond the drip line. Generally, we say that. In a, in a perfect situation, like an ideal environment where the soil is good and there's no kind of either man-made or natural disturbances in the soil, the roots can extend up to one to three times the height of the tree laterally. Right? So they extend well beyond the drip line. And as you'll notice, you know, this diagram, like the roots go down to about 30 inches. In this diagram, it goes down to about three feet, 36 inches. Right? Not a coincidence that most of the roots are within the top 30 inches of soil here, and most of the roots in this diagram are within the top 30 inches, right? So these, these two diagrams are completely separate. I harvested them from the internet. Um, but it's, it's not a coincidence that they align in where roots are growing. Right? So when we talk about trees tipping over because they're shallow rooted, like, well, I mean, if you want to get technical, like every tree is shallow rooted. Um, now, if you, if you live in a, a place like Eastern Washington where you have a lot of sand, soil, then the sand is, is much bigger and chunkier as a soil particle than something like clay, which is really fine. So if you imagine like clay would be like marbles, um, silt would be like golf balls, and sand is like basketballs, right? So when you have bigger soil particles, you have more void spaces. You have bigger void spaces between them because of, of where these large particles touch. 
right? There's more opportunity for space in between them, where you have tiny particles that touch, fewer, fewer and smaller uh, void spaces between them. Actually, not fewer, more. But yeah. Anyway, so where you have a sandy soil, you have more oxygen because you have more pore space, and the roots can grow much, much deeper. Um, and that can be the difference a lot of times in. Protection because where you have those sandy, well aerated soils that are supporting trees, you can you can sometimes get away with a little bit more encroachment on those tree root systems in the development process than if the soil is straight clay. But here in Western Washington, we're mostly dealing with clay and glacial fill. So not too much in the way of sandy soils, unless you're right on the Right on the shoreline of Puget Sound, you're not going to find any sandy soil. Potentially some power. <coughs> so, let's go into my first activity here. Uh, <coughs> so, this, uh, you know, I try to, I mean, many of you have seen me present before, and I try to mix things up a little bit because I can only reinvent myself so much. Um, but this time we have, um, so let's just, let's just start, pass those around, and then we'll start coming back over here, and then hopefully there'll be one for everyone. Please, you guys pass them back. 